Uh, good afternoon. So uh, when, when Courtney asked me if I would come and do this talk for you guys, I, I kind of asked what might be useful. And she was saying, well, you know, everybody uh, sits throughout the day and is on the computer and uh, deals with neck pain, shoulder pain. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about office ergonomics and maybe give you guys some strategies to better set up your workstation. Obviously, if there's questions directly pertaining to uh, neck pain or, or shoulder pain or any other pain that you might be dealing with, I can certainly speak to that. But uh, hopefully, again, this gives you guys some uh, ideas on uh, better workstation setup. I know it's not the most exciting topic in the world, but uh, again, hopefully it's useful. So I'm going to breeze through some of this because this is actually a slightly longer presentation. Um, and some of them doesn't necessarily pertain directly to you. But um, as you can see, the, the desk that you sit at all day uh, can, can be uh, either a cause of pain or certainly um, a situation that doesn't cause you any pain. So ergonomics, what that is, is there's a, a variety of different areas of ergonomics. There's physical, cognitive, and organizational ergonomics, each of them dealing with different aspects of uh, the workstation setup uh, and, and each of those playing a role in uh, whether or not that individual develops uh, cumulative trauma disorder or, or a painful neck, shoulder, etc. <clears throat> so uh, what's important about ergonomics is it can be simple things that can make a big difference and really decrease the, uh, the tissue load and be enough to uh, really uh, enable you to get through an entire day without having any pain. One of the, uh, the things, and this really goes throughout activity, whether you're an endurance athlete and uh, have knee pain or a office worker that has neck pain, it's essentially the inability of that body to, of the body to heal sufficiently to compensate for uh, the loads that are placed on it throughout the day. So again, it's about minimizing the loads that's being experienced by that joint or that tissue, and then uh, uh, ideally improving or enabling the body to sufficiently heal. <clears throat> so this is the general concept, again, that I was just describing about how cumulative trauma disorders occur or dysfunctions occur. Uh, you have a bucket, a proverbial bucket, and you have wear and tear going into that bucket, and a some form of outlet being the healing. So if you're not healing enough and not enough of that paint or water or whatever you want to say is going into the bucket is coming out, eventually the bucket overflows, which is essentially uh, the, the, uh, the idea of when that tissue becomes dysfunctional. So uh, our goal is to, again, either minimize the loads that are going into the bucket and, or maximize the healing, maximize the, uh, the draining of that bucket. So some of the things that, that pertain directly to you guys uh, that uh, play a role are going to be the external factors, such as repetitive motions, doing the same thing over and over and over again, uh, forceful exertion, maybe awkward postures, uh, contact stress, which we'll talk about, inadequate rest, and then certain things with job stress, uh, if you guys ever have that, uh, vibration, cold and heat, etc. Okay? So the, the primary issue is awkward postures. So uh, one with neck pain, we'll look at the monitor position, knowing where that should be uh, relative to the position of your body, uh, the upper back being uh, affected by the position of the keyboard, the monitor, uh, the armrests as well, and then the low back being affected by seat position, foot position. So here's an example of a improper workstation setup. Um, and also you can look at repetitive motion in these postures as well. So if you're consistently keyboarding or um, using the mouse, those can al also lead to cumulative uh, trauma disorders. So here's an example of contact stress. I'm sure nobody in here does that. Uh, but again, resting the arms or certain places of the, uh, 
uh, of the forearm on whatever surface it is that you're trying to work on uh, can obviously lead to breakdown of those tissues in that area. This is kind of one of the primary causes of carpal tunnel. Stressful conditions, uh, you can see some of the factors related to stress, but uh, stress also impairs healing. So uh, when you're stressed out with work, you actually have an increase in a chemical called cortisol that flows through your body, and that essentially limits the ability of your body to heal. So um, if you are stressed out or not getting much sleep because you have a new baby, uh, all of those type things can lead to increased stress which means decreased healing, which means it's easier for that bucket that we were talking about earlier to overflow. <clears throat> Some of the personal factors, age. Uh, as we age, the ability of our tissues to heal uh, can decrease. Uh, gender, there's different aspects when it comes to gender as far as uh, cumulative trauma disorders. Uh, females tend to be uh, more loosey-goosey as far as their joints, which means that the muscles have to do a lot more work, which also can lead to uh, cumulative stress disorders. Uh, smoking, that also impairs the ability of the body to heal. So if you look at uh, the capillaries or the blood supply to tissues, as we smoke, it actually uh, kind of infiltrates those capillaries and decreases the amount of perfusion or the amount of blood that actually gets to those tissues which also leads to uh, an inability to heal. So it decreases uh, that, that spigot uh, or the amount that the uh, spigot's able to essentially um, uh, allow out. Uh, physical activity, uh, strength also plays a role in anthropometry. Uh, that is essentially your measurements and uh, your weight, height, et cetera. And then some other things that play a role, diabetes. Diabetes decreases your ability to heal as well. Um, thyroid disease, hormonal status, uh, hobbies as well. So uh, your body doesn't care whether you're sitting at a desk here or sitting at a desk at home. So uh, if you're here for an entire work day and uh, your neck is undergoing this much stress over the course of the day and then you go home and you um, sit at the computer at home, same thing, uh, unless your workstation setup is different one area versus the other. All right, so some of the things that we can look at are at your workstation, the chair, the keyboard, the mouse, monitor, um, and, and then also lighting, glare, etc. Some of those things you can change, some of them you can't, but they all play a role in uh, the ergonomics. So a seat position, uh, from a height standpoint, you want to ensure that your feet are able to, and you can see on that picture to the far right, uh, you want to ensure that your hips are higher than your knees. Um, this enables your feet to rest on the floor. Uh, you don't want your hips below your knees, which puts uh, actually more strain on your low back, puts more strain on your hips. Uh, so having a slightly elevated seat height. Uh, you also want to ensure that the, uh, what's called the seat pan or the depth of the seat is sufficient to support your thigh. Um, ideally greater than three quarters of your thigh because uh, again that decreases the stress on uh, the back of your leg. Okay, so if you're dealing with say uh, sciatica type symptoms or leg pain uh, that may be related to a shorter seat pan depth. Uh, <clears throat> there are other things, uh, and again, looking at the knee angle, uh, that we're, we're going to kind of talk about all these things as we go along. And you can see the wrist rest, you can see the elbow uh, rest, but having somebody that's in more of that upright position uh, and sitting properly. <clears throat> all right, so we were talking about that. All right, from a proper chair height, so like I said, uh, the and that should actually be the knee slightly lower than the seat of the chair. Uh, you can either rest your foot on the floor or a foot rest, uh, but having uh, yourself in a position where uh, you're, you're uh, able to sit up straight. If your knees come up above your level of your hips, you're, you can't sit up straight. You can't uh, anteriorly rotate your pelvis, essentially, to take stress off your low back. 
Uh, you should have armrests. It looks like most of you guys here have armrests. Um, but you should have them at an adequate height so that your arms just ha uh, hang essentially straight to your sides and they rest on the armrests and you should use them as well. Uh, that is a common factor in carpal tunnel because if you don't have the armrests, you are using your, uh, or typically resting the weight on your forearms or your wrists, which can lead to uh, those contact stresses we were talking about earlier and cumulative stress there. The other uh, thing that can happen in that situation if you don't have armrests and you're not resting them here is you can develop um, neck pain or upper trap these muscles here pain there as they're trying to hold your arms up throughout the day so armrests are a uh, or should be a common part of your office setup <clears throat> so the height and orientation of the uh, keyboard, you want it at the same level as the uh, height of your armrest because you can see that individual, their arms are straight out. Uh, you don't want it above uh, because that's going to mean that you're going to have to excessively flex your wrists as you're typing or below because then you have contact stresses where you're resting your forearm on uh, the workstation. So you want it at the same level as your armrest. Uh, and uh, from a placement standpoint, obviously the ergonomic keyboards um, are better because they prevent you from um, needing to deviate your wrist to get to certain places on the keyboard. Um, that's how they were designed. Uh, but then from a placement standpoint, again, keeping it directly in front of you uh, within the uh, a sufficient distance you don't want to be reaching for your keyboard out here. You want it so your elbows are flexed to a 90 degree angle and keeping that keyboard in that area as well. Uh, one of the things that we talk to patients is about is keeping 75% of their activity within this radius in their workstation and then 25% beyond that, uh, that range. So the, the very infrequently should you have to reach out as you're going through your day. So we talked about this, shoulders should be relaxed, forearms should be parallel to the floor, and then elbows should rest at your side instead of being out in front of you. So as far as the keyboard is concerned, we want to avoid extension. We also want to avoid uh, flexion because that will compress or stretch your carpal tunnel. So your carpal tunnel is right here. The reason they call that is because these bones right here are your carpals and it's a U-shaped area where all your tendons to your hand go through and it's covered by a uh, ligament on top of that. So it looks like a U with a ligament on top with all these tendons going through. And if you're resting your wrist down on the table, that compresses your carpal tunnel and it can lead to um, hand symptoms, typically uh, weakness and or numbness and tingling into that area. So we want to avoid positions that either increase the pressure on that carpal tunnel um, or compress that carpal tunnel like maximum flexion, maximum extension. Uh, then the other side of that is avoiding alder deviation uh, because you also have a uh, tunnel here that your ulnar nerve goes through to uh, provide sensory uh, and actually muscle innervation to some of the uh, portions of your lateral hand or the outside of your hand. So if you're in a ulnarly deviated position, which means that way, if you are in an ulnarly deviated position for prolonged periods of time, that can also compress some of those structures on the outside of your wrist and lead to wrist pain or ulnar symptoms. <clears throat> so, uh, what this is saying here is, again, it's not necessarily that you're using your keyboard, you're using your mouse, it's more that your wrist may be positioned improperly. Um, so ideally you want your wrist in a relative neutral position with even a slight extension. And you can see the lower picture shows if you're keying like this, where there's the compression of the ulnar or carpal tunnel and then uh, the other situation with extension where it's being stretched and compressed. 
<clears throat> so uh, you can see some of the keyboard options that are out there that help to uh, avoid a flexed or uh, improper keyboard setup. Uh, so there's all kinds of different mouse setups. Uh, ideally, having one that uh, does allow your hand to be in a relative neutral position, uh, and uh, so you don't have to extend your wrist to get to it and compress that carpal tunnel. Uh, so maintaining that neutral position as you move it. Uh, and again, we have all kinds of different available pointing devices, as they call them, trackball, touchpad, touchscreen. Uh, some of those are better just in that uh, they enable you to not be in a static position for a prolonged period of time. If you're mousing, a lot of times people will just leave their hand on the mouse and they compress their carpal tunnel over a period of time. Uh, the monitor is a setup that uh, the, is one of the primary causes of neck pain and, uh, and more often than not is improperly set up. This is probably one of the ones that we end up changing with individuals more often. Uh, obviously you want your monitor straight in front of you. You don't want it off to the side. Uh, again, I know that particularly when you're dealing with a bunch of computers, often you have uh, multiple potentially around you, but the one you are looking at should be directly ahead of you uh, because prolonged rotation um, can, again, lead to neck pain, especially if you're doing that over the course of an eight-hour day. Uh, also, if you're turning your head throughout the day, that can also lead to cumulative trauma. Uh, and then the viewing angle should be within 10 degrees of a neutral uh, viewing angle. Uh, there, there's been discussion whether 10 degrees below, 10 degrees above is optimal. Um, ideally, you want it essentially right around a neutral position. So um, to you, the idea, however, is you don't want to end up in a position where you're looking up, where your neck is extended for a prolonged period of time. But you don't, however, um, want your screen much lower than you, so you have to look down for a prolonged period of time. You want it in a neutral position. <coughs> Okay, so preferred viewing distance is anywhere from 18 to 24 inches. Uh, you don't want to be right in front of your monitor because that can cause uh, issues with the eyes. Eye strain uh, can also lead to headaches as well. <clears throat> so one of the things about the position of the monitor, uh, not only can it cause neck pain, um, just based on the position of your neck, uh, can cause the eye strain, which can cause headaches, but also the position of the neck can cause headaches as well. <clears throat> so uh, if you are having to read or key from a document to your computer, uh, ideally placing the document in a position that you don't have to make frequent changes of position. So if you have a document here and you have your computer over here and you're always having to look back and forth, as you do that, that also can lead to, to issues. So you can see some of the setups here where the document's right below, uh, in between the monitor and the keyboard, allowing them to uh, essentially use their eyes to uh, navigate between the monitor and the source document. Um, the other option, as you can see in that top right picture, is having it right next to the monitor. So again, small motions uh, to minimize that neck and upper back pain. Uh, and then the work process, uh, looking at everything from prolonged repetitive activities, uh, <laughs> inappropriate production requirements, but I think that's everywhere, uh, excessive overtime, inadequate medical awareness, and then inadequate training. <clears throat> so um, just ensuring that there are proper rest breaks, one of the things that uh, particularly those who work on computers throughout the day, ensuring that there are times to get up, walk around, um, stretch. Uh, there are a, a couple simple things that can be done um, to ensure the muscles that are most likely to get weak in a sitting position are you're keeping them strong. Some of the examples are, uh, for example, we always do things kind of in this area in front of us. So instead of uh, simply uh, 
going through our day and figuring, well, the muscles of the back stay strong, I'm not really worried about them. Doing things to actively strengthen the muscles of the back as easy as, uh, for example, our individuals who work in an, in an office that have neck pain, we might tell them every hour, I want you to pull your shoulder blades back 10 times um, just to take some stress off those anterior structures, including the deep neck flexors of your neck and um, your upper traps. So uh, pulling your shoulder blades back together reactivates or uh, facilitates is the word, so it activates those muscles that are lower and takes some pressure off the muscles that are higher because a prolonged flexed position stretches out the muscle and muscles that are stretched end up uh, inhibited or it actually uh, limits the amount of activation of those muscles. So pulling your shoulder blades back together can turn them back on or allow them to do a better job. So uh, pulling the shoulder blades back together might have individuals uh, tucking their chin straight back, which works on the uh, deep neck flexor, strengthens those muscles, uh, which takes some pressure off the muscles of your neck. Uh, and then uh, another example would be pulling the shoulders back like so, uh, to work on the rotator cuff muscles. Rotator cuff, just briefly, are the muscles that attach to your shoulder blade. So there's four of them, one underneath the shoulder blade and then three, two here and one on the top, uh, that essentially stabilize your, uh, your shoulder bone, your uh, humerus, in your glenoid or the part of your shoulder blade that uh, enables the 180 degrees of motion that you have uh, in your shoulder. So uh, it stabilizes that bone in that socket and uh, because we're always doing things out here, those muscles get stretched and they become dysfunctional, which is why then we reach overhead and we start noticing shoulder pain with repetitive motions overhead or um, even uh, minimal motions. We might go home, lift the jug of milk out of the refrigerator and notice shoulder pain, which is typically due to insufficiency of that rotator cuff, which is being stretched all day because we sit at a computer. So uh, working on the rotator cuff, just simple exercises to activate them. Uh, and uh, the, one of the, the things we talk to our athletes about, because again, athletes go through the same problem because the majority of their motions occur bringing their arm this way, like throwing a ball, for example and none occur this way, and this is the direction that your rotator cuff is doing the most work um, or being strengthened. So uh, I kind of tell them the analogy of it's like the muscles that go this way are a Ferrari, the muscles that go that way are more like a VW bus. Uh, so we want these muscles going back this way to be just as strong as the ones that pull the arm forward. And again, that's your rotator cuff. <clears throat> so uh, finding time to take those breaks and uh, whether it be get up, walk, stretch, um, some type of change of position can help to uh, decrease the stress on those uh, uh, tissues and also allow better healing to occur. <clears throat> so, uh, and we're talking here directly about overtime, but uh, that also pertains to um, the activities that we do at home. So again, if you're on your computer here and then you go home and you're on your computer, uh, that can also lead to cumulative trauma. So the body doesn't care whether it's during work hours or not. <clears throat> uh, so, and again, this can, uh, this is related to the eye strain that we were talking about earlier. If you don't have adequate lighting, that obviously can lead to uh, greater difficulty in viewing your work documents, which can be related to development of headaches so, um, and or neck pain. So uh, as is described here, um, having a bright light on the display screen washes out images, um, which can again lead to eye strain. So trying to keep some contrast in the computer screen to better enable you to see the, uh, what you're looking at. 
So we talked about keeping the majority of the work close to you, uh, keeping it within that 75% or within this radius, 75% uh, of your work within that radius, working those no neutral postures that we talked about um, as far as the armrest, as far as your foot and low back position, and then changing position off, positions often. So that's once an hour getting up, stretching, uh, doing some type of movement, getting up and walking. Uh, keeping things in easy reach. Uh, and again, this kind of shows some of the awkward postures that may be related to uh, cumulative uh, trauma disorders. So you can see, you can just simplify that position to make it easier to get, to enable somebody to get to uh, whatever they're working with. So neck straight, shoulders relaxed, elbows at your side, wrists straight. Uh, and then three curves in the back, that's so, uh, one of the things that uh, there's actually been a fair about, uh, amount of research on over the past 10 years is posture. We've talked about posture forever and you know, a lot of times when people think of physical therapists, they think of, oh, posture. Uh, but it hasn't been terribly well understood and why or what conditions it might be most effective for. And if when you were younger, your mother told you to sit up straight. Most people sit up super straight and, in fact, uh, adopt what's called a long thoracic posture, um, which isn't even the, the proper or correct posture. So there's three types of postures. There's long thoracic, which is the one where you try to sit up super straight. Uh, and what happens in that situation, you can maintain it for maybe three minutes, five minutes, and then you go back into the old posture, you were in the slumped posture, which is the second one. So you can sit in kind of this slumped position. Uh, and then the third one is called a short lordosis. So a uh, long thoracic is the most inefficient. And again, that's shown by uh, EMG studies, but you, you can tell because if you sit up straight, you can't maintain that for very long. The Slump is the most efficient, which is why most of us adopt that position or posture, because uh, you can sit in that posture for prolonged periods of time and, and not have it bother you. Uh, the problem is, is it puts a lot of stress on some of the, uh, uh, the non-active structures, the passive structures of the body, like the ligaments, uh, for example. Puts some stress on the ligaments, uh, which can lead to that uh, con connective tissue uh, trauma. The uh, third, the short lordosis, which is actually a proper posture, is essentially putting your back in the same position that you're in when you stand. So you have a little bit of a curve here at your low back, then you have a curve going the opposite direction in what's called your thoracic spine, and then your neck has a curve, uh, another lordosis. So you should have a curve at the neck, a curve going the opposite direction, your mid back and then a small curve at the low back. So when you sit up straight, instead of curving a big, huge curve up to the way high into the middle of your back, you should have just a small one, which you can do by just tilting your pelvis forward as you sit, which is again why you want your knees to be slightly lower uh, than your hips, because otherwise you can't get in that anteriorly tilted position. Uh, and that en enables you to get those three curves in your back. Uh, and whereas that position is less efficient than a slump position, you are protecting structures and you're utilizing muscles that are built to be able to contract for long periods of time. So it, it should be an easier position to maintain for um, a, an eight hour workday. Uh, so again, we don't want the elbows away from the body, we want them in close, because uh, that increases stress on for example, with this individual on their wrist, as uh, that's the part of their body that's resting on the workstation. Uh, it's also increasing stress to uh, his mid-back uh, because his shoulders are in what's called a protracted position or a position where he's reaching. Uh, and uh, that can lead to uh, mid-back pain versus having his shoulder blades back and in a neutral position. Uh, one of the the sayings that we utilize is uh, proximal stability for distal mobility. And what that means is the more stable we are centrally, uh, the stronger the muscles are, and the better position we're in centrally, 
the better we're uh, able to use our arms efficiently because the stress that comes through your hand gets worked all the way up through your arm to your mid back and if those muscles are in a compromised position for example reaching out uh, that can that can lead to um, dysfunction in that area so there's a much better example of how that individual should be mousing or keyboarding <clears throat> Okay, and you can see some examples of the mouse being too far away, resting the wrist on and having those contact stresses between the table and that individual's wrist versus having it nearby and in a neutral position with their wrist. Uh, minimizing the pressure points, if you do have to sit um, at a table that doesn't necessarily fit you appropriately or perfectly, you can get some type of guard uh, whether it be that example there or having some type of cushioning which decreases those uh, contact stresses on those pressure points. But again, ideally enabling uh, his wrist to be in a position or his forearms to be in a position where there aren't those direct kind of uh, perpendicular contact stresses. Uh, we mentioned this, making sure that we're moving, exercising, stretching. Um, and changing between sitting and standing. Uh, I understand that there's a standing workstation here somewhere. Back there, okay. Yeah, so uh, having a standing uh, workstation, changing position, going back there, using that for a period during the day. Uh, again, you can run into similar problems with prolonged standing, but if you're alternating between those work postures, that again decreases the risk of cumulative trauma from one specific uh, position. So, uh, you know, one of the nice things about my job is I may sit for a period of time, stand for a period of time, but I'm always act, uh, active and moving around. But um, if you are on the computer for a prolonged period of time, finding opportunities to change position or get out of that, that position. <clears throat> so this is just showing what uh, some of the things that we'll see as far as ergonomics are concerned. Uh, you can see uh, the individual isn't even facing his computer. Uh, you can see the position of his feet kind of resting up on uh, the, uh, the undersurface of his chair, whatever those things are called. Uh, and uh, just overall a, a pretty poor position. <clears throat> All right. Any questions about any of that? Okay. Yeah, I mean, so that's probably more reality. Uh, I mean, again, if, if you talk about somebody who works in the same cubicle day, cubicle day in, day out, obviously they can modify their uh, workstation to be perfect for them. But like you said, if, you, if you're in a situation where you can't necessarily do that, one, you can uh, maximize based on the variables you do have available to you, which uh, any given day you can probably change the seat height uh, it does look like uh, many of these chairs do have armrests. You can um, either, uh, some of them are modifiable chair uh, armrests, but uh, if they aren't, you can at least try to put yourself in a position that's best because it's extremes. It's not, it's on a spectrum and it's not like either you are in the, a good position or you aren't. It's, it's, it's a varying degree of to what, uh, how good of a position you're in. So if you can decrease the bad, improve the good, particularly as it pertains to what might be, say you deal with shoulder pain on occasion, then you can set your uh, workstation up so that it's best for shoulder pain and maybe a little bit harder on your back because that's the best option that you have in this situation. Um, now that being said, the other thing I would recommend is, again, getting up moving, stretching, doing a couple exercises. Because, like, uh, let me give you an example. So there are, there's four main stabilizers of your low back, okay? Your 
butt muscles, your glutes, okay, your lats, your big back muscles, then your multifidi, which are really little muscles that are in your low back, and then your what's called your transverse abdominis, which is kind of like a girdle that goes around your, your waist. And of those four muscles, the multifidi are most responsive to stress. So, or excuse me, stretch. So if you're sitting in a flexed position for a long, prolonged period of time, they turn off. And if that muscle turns off, then uh, you go to get up and move, okay? And that muscle is responsible for controlling the position of your low back joints. So you go to get up and you're going from a flex position to an extended position, because you have to to be able to stand up unless we want to stand like that. So you have to do that to stand up. As you go to get up, it's not doing its job. And so the analogy I use with patients, it's like you just stepped in a pothole and the muscles of your lower leg aren't really controlling the position. So what happens? You twist your ankle. So as you stand up, if those muscles aren't doing their job, the joint goes a little bit too far and you sprain that joint. Then th those are the people who say to me, oh, well, I was just picking up a pencil or I was just standing up from my desk or I just moved and my back went out. And, and that's essentially what's happening is those muscles that are, their role is to stabilize or control the position of that joint, uh, essentially are, are sleeping or are turned off or however you want to kind of think of it. Um, so by changing position and frequently saying, okay, hey, let's get out of this position where we're stretched over a period of time. Let's change position. Let's get up. Let's move around. Let's work on extending our low back as we sit. Uh, those things can help keep that muscle engaged and keep it from taking a nap. Any other questions? To, to, yeah, to some degree. I mean, our, our, a lot of these ergonomic issues and a lot of these uh, workplace issues haven't uh, or have evolved with the 20th century, with uh, us having more of these office type um, settings and, and people being in jobs where they're sitting in a static position. Our bodies are dynamic. Our bodies are meant to move. They're not meant to be static. So uh, giving it an outlet, giving the body a way to move and change position can, uh, again, decrease uh, the stress that one structure is um, undergoing at any given time. Yeah, no, 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 absolutely. Uh, uh, so to some degree, that's a hard question because that's dealing with a large area. We're basically dealing from head to toe. Um, so yes, there are certain exercises and there are specific things that you can do. The, the advice that I'll give you, and, and maybe you have a follow-up question to that, but uh, the advice that I would give you is if you've been in a position for a long period of time, going from one extreme to another doesn't work. And this is what I always tell patients. So uh, I had a patient this morning. I'll, I'll just give you a quick example that may or may not pertain. Uh, <laughs> he was a runner who had been um, uh, dealing with some, some medial knee pain over a long period of time. And I got him on the treadmill, watched him run. Long story short, he ran with a very slow cadence. So he was only, uh, his feet would strike about 160 times per minute, which is, in the grand scheme of things, considered too low. So the ideal, uh, ideal may not be the right word, but where we want to get somebody is closer towards 180. So he is significantly lower than that, but I can't tell him, hey, I want you to go out for a run and run at 180. I have to tell him, well, let's start at 165, and it's going to feel really weird, and it's going to feel awkward, but that's starting you in the right direction. So if you've been sitting in a position for a prolonged period of time that's not the right position, you can't go from, I was sitting terribly so to now I'm sitting perfectly. Um, I tend to tell individuals start with 
one area. So if you have an area that's a particular uh, focus, I guess, uh, whether it be your low back. So you start with your low back and say, I'm just going to try to change a little bit. Let me work on my seat height. Let me make sure the seat pan is an appropriate length. And let's just work on being able to, every once in a while, tilt my pelvis forward as I sit. Only a little bit. I shouldn't feel like an excessive strain or I shouldn't feel uh, like, gosh, that feels like a really big stretch. Just a nice gentle. Get used to being in that position. Once you've kind of maximized that, uh, then you start looking elsewhere. So, okay, now I feel like my back is in a better position and hey, I've even noticed some changes, some positive changes in how I sit. So now let's maybe look at what my shoulders are doing or what my, my neck is doing and changing monitor height. So changing one thing at a time instead of, because again, if you change 10 things all at once, uh, you tend to set yourself up for failure where you're gonna uh, uh, go back to the way you were sitting. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you.